Good afternoon and welcome to the penultimate Applied Physiology Friday for the summer of 2020. Today we're going to be talking about the central nervous system and its role in practice planning. Now I've been given a lot of love to the autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions, and my central nervous system this week said to me, hey bro, you're giving all this love to the autonomic nervous system. Well, why not give us some love? So today, it's the parasympathetics day. Taking a look at our first slide, looking at the elements of a practice. For all my sport coaches out there, when we're putting a practice together, there's going to be three key elements. You have your technical elements, your tactical elements, and then your strength and conditioning. One of the unsung principles of training is the principle of separation. And what I mean by the principle of separation is we keep all of our like components together and then we give a little bit of a break and then we work some more like some more like components, a little bit of a break, and then we work some more like components and then we take it to the house. So a lot of strength coaches or a lot of coaches that are just starting out try to combine all three into one drill or they try to combine two of the three into one main practice and it turns out like a hodgepodge or it turns out like some of the meals that they would serve at the cafeterias at Syracuse when at the end of the semester so just whatever's left in the refrigerator is going into the pot we're going to stir it up and serve it up and you know that didn't taste good and as a practice it doesn't work good our technical skills are going to be the sports skills we want to think about in terms of hockey and lacrosse, shooting, passing, catching, the fundamentals. Our tactical skills are going to involve speed, agility, quickness, and infusing the technical skills in a game situation. And then our strength and conditioning, muscular strength, muscular endurance, flexibility, cardiovascular, aerobic, anaerobic, all that rock and roll that we've been pretty much touching on for the previous eight sessions. As a, as a coach, we're given one hour of team practice each day, and we need to address many facets of this. Uh, today's background brought to you by Union College, Coach Rick Bennett's um, office right here, Mesa Rink at the Achilles Center. We got the banners hanging up there. And Coach Bennett, uh, one of my favorite coaches in the whole world, and he has allowed me to come to practice, and he's allowed me to see how he structures technical, tactical, strength, and conditioning. And his resume, he, wear, he can wear his resume on one hand. It's got the 2014 National Championship NCAA D1 hockey. Looking at the central nervous system, our central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. So the central nervous system is where the processing happens. When we talk about processing and strength and conditioning, that's a, a really hot term these days. Processing means decision making at speed, whatever speed is. If we are a sport coach, it's the decision-making at the speed of that game. It's the decision-making at the speed of hockey, at the speed of lacrosse. Or if you're a football coach, the decision-making for the quarterback at the speed of whatever level that quarterback's playing at. If we're looking at a distance runner, it's the race speed. What decisions do I need to make? I need to process all of this information in terms of internal and external data. and then send a message down my spinal cord out to my peripheral nervous system to do things, to pick up pace, to slow pace down in terms of running, in terms of hockey, do I pass, do I shoot for lacrosse, do I pull down and dodge, do I shoot, what type of dodge am I going to do? All those are examples of processing, decision making at the speed of life. For my aspiring physical therapists out here, when we look at what is processing for you, processing for a physical therapist is getting my patient to do 
game specific, life specific ADLs at the speed of life. So if we're looking at crossing the street, a, a processing for a, a patient getting ready to cross the street is going to be, I see the bus. Is that bus closing in on me? How much time do I have to cross the street before the bus and me meet and it ends badly? Processing, decision-making at speed. That's what the central nervous system does. In one of the main things that it does in terms of human performance, in terms of game situations. So as coaches, we're trying to prime that central nervous system to be better at decision-making at speed. One of the many things we have to address in practice. In terms of our practice elements, I like to classify practice elements as either high CNS or low CNS. High CNS, how much brain power is involved? A high CNS skill is going to involve a lot of brain power. A low CNS skill is going to involve not a lot of brain power. When we think about high CNS skills, those are going to be speed, agility, quickness, accuracy. Those are all high CNS skills. In, in terms of looking at lacrosse, when we're doing a metabolic cash out at the end of practice and we're going to run a rack, all we're doing essentially is running up and down the field. That's going to be a low CNS skill low central nervous system. So there's not much decision making going on in terms of the CNS. I run to this line, I stop, I turn around, I run back. I run to that line, stop, turn around, run back. That's what is going on with a low CNS skill, not much brain power. Whereas when we look at a high CNS skill, there's a lot of things going on. So when we look at shooting a lacrosse ball, taking a lacrosse shot, I got to start. The first thing I got to do is execute a fake. I got to get the goalie moving. Then from there, I got to see which way the goalie moves and be prepared to either throw a second fake or to take a shot. A little bit of a distraction there. We'll be back at it. So uh, the, I actually, I had a, uh, a technical difficulty in here. And so if I'm playing goalie, technology just threw me a fake, got me off my feet. So when we're, so when we're looking at taking a shot uh, as, a, as a goalie, high, or a, taking a shot as a, a attack player, I throw a fake, get the goalie moving, and then I got to very quickly process, which way did he go? What's his tendency? And now Am I going to make another fake and put up a shot, or am I just going to put up a shot right away? So that's going to be a, a high CNS skill. We're going to get into, in a minute, talking about small-sided games as a part of a warm-up. But before we get into that, an operational definition of what a small-sided game is. Coach Bennett has been gracious enough to allow me to come to practice, and one of the things that he likes to do is start out with a small-sided 3v3 game. So he will put the, the goals on the hockey rink, he'll put them right here on what's called the train tracks. So he'll put a goal here, he'll put a goal here, there'll be a goalie in goal. This will be the far bound, or this will be the near boundary of the ice. Put the players here, have one, have one team here, one team here, and then they're going to go three on three for about a minute. And then this team, this, this entire, this, the, the two teams that are playing are going to come off. A new batch of six 3v3 are going to go on. They're going to go up and down the ice. And that is going to activate the, the autonomic nervous system. We're going to move our athletes into that sympathetic dominance. The other thing it's going to do in terms of CNS is involve a lot of decision making. Now the game is live. The game is fast. One of the ways that we can increase CNS activation is to shorten the field. So instead of playing a 200 foot game, we're going to be playing about 50 feet, about a 50 foot game, having our players play both offense and defense, increasing that processing speed. That's going to activate that, that central nervous system, 
prime the athletes for what's coming next, whether it be a high CNS, low physiological stress station, or some sort of a teaching period. For lacrosse, one of the ways we can put a small-sided game into the practice plan, start out with 3v3 right here in the restraining box. So we put a goalie in goal, and then we have 3v3 in the restraining box. We can have two games going. The roster size in lacrosse is about double of what the roster size is in, in college hockey when we're looking at NCAA D1. College hockey, 25-30. Lacrosse, upwards of 50. So if we want to get the whole team buzzing, we want to go, in terms of lacrosse, we'll go two half-field games for hockey. We don't, we don't want to get our athletes tired. This isn't an ESD period. This is an activation period. This is a wake-up period. So we want to keep the, the shift short. We want to keep the speed high, and we want to keep the decision-making high. Looking at our practice plan. And this is, this is a, an amalgamation of best practices, things I learned from Coach Bennett, things I've learned from Coach McConnell from when he was at UMass Lowell. He's now in the NHL with New Jersey. Things that we've done, uh, I've done with Coach Murphy in Jacksonville at the ECHL, and things I've learned from Coach Billy Ward at, when he was at Syracuse, and, and then he was at Charlotte Christian, and now he's a privateer strength coach. So credit due to those four. That would be like the Mount Rushmore of today's presentation. When we're looking at a practice plan, remember we're going high CNS to low CNS. The reason why is that the brain gets tired. Just like the muscles, we run out of decisions. Some, this is something I talk about with my wife, Rachel, on the regular. So shout out to my wife, Rachel. We have a phrase around the house where when it gets late in the day, I'm out of decisions. We don't, the body, the brain only has a certain amount of decisions to make each day. As the day goes on, we start to run out of decisions. When we're out of decisions, we make bad choices. As coaches, we need to realize that we have a finite amount of decisions to make and decision-making, processing our high CNS activities. We're going to put all of our CNS, high CNS activities early in practice so that we can get the most out of our brain power. And brain power has a shorter shelf life than physiological power. So we're going to put our ESD work at the end, we start out with a small, brief, small sided game. And this is the before we hit the ice or before we hit the, the practice field, we're going to do our movement warm up. We're going to do our mobility work somewhere around 10, 15 minutes. Then we hit the field. We begin with a, the field just hit me. We begin with a small-sided game to wake up the CNS. And this is also going to get the players engaged in practice. We're going to give them a preview of what we're going to be teaching today. If we're doing, if in lacrosse or in hockey, we're doing power play in hockey, we're doing man up, man down in lacrosse, maybe we start out with a brief small-sided game where we are man up, man down situation, a power play situation to, to get their attention. This is what I need to be working on in a power play. This is what I need to be working on if I'm playing man down and on a PK. The brief small-sided game sets the stage for practice and it answers the question, what am I going to be improving today? As coaches, always be answering the why. Why am I doing this drill? If you don't know the answer for that, don't do it. My, my computer just wants to get to the field of ESD. I don't, not yet, because when we get there, the presentation is done. Small-sided games from a physiological side, 
high energy, high time on retention, this means that we are developing either on ice power or on field power. And that's what is essential for success in the competitive arena. The next thing we're gonna do is dial it back a little bit. We're gonna, for example, when I was coaching lacrosse, we'd start out with some 3v3 in the restraining box, then we would move to a high CNS period. And this is an example of this is gonna be what I call state fair shooting. Quick story on state fair, that's an homage to my mom. My mom ran a jam and jelly business for years and she was a multiple time New York State Fair, blue ribbon, gold medal winning uh, jam and jelly producer. And her stuff was state fair quality. So when we talk about state fair shooting, we think about my mom and how her jams and jellies were of always of state fair quality. And of course, I got to throw a quick homage to my dad, who would also help in the state fair quality packaging of said jams and jellies. So when we're talking about state fair shooting, we're, this is high quality, it's high accuracy. It's not gonna be just throwing shots on the goal. It's gonna be picking a corner, picking a spot, throwing a fake, and then putting the, the ball in the goal. In motor learning, we talk about the speed accuracy trade-off. As speed of movement increases, accuracy decreases. In our high CNS period, it is going to be a very high accuracy movement. We, we want to bring, if, if we're shooting in on goal, we want to bring the athletes in to somewhere within three feet of the goal so we can develop that high accuracy, that high CNS about 10, 10 minutes of state fair shooting. And another reason we call it state fair shooting is we have multiple goals set up either on the ice or on the field and the athletes move station to station to station, much like you move from booth to booth to booth at a state fair. One, one goal we're shooting upper right, next goal at the next goal station, we're shooting lower left. The next one, maybe we throw a fake in and, and go to our offhand and put a shot up, but at each station, our, we, we work all the way around two minutes per goal, but 10 minute period, we're, we're doing something different, but it's gonna be high accuracy. Maybe between periods two and three, we do a little bit of a, if we're coaching hockey, Coach Bennett loves this, it's great. He'll do a really quick two minute, one minute, two minute skate, just to wake up the legs, so they may do a, a down and back, so a, a 400 foot skate at about tempo pace, 80, 90% uh, fresh pace, wake up the legs, get the heart pumping. And then we water up and then we move into our teaching period. Our teaching period is gonna reflect what we, what we previewed in our small sided game. If today's theme is power play, penalty kill, man up, man down. We began the day with a brief small sided game that gets the athletes aware of what they're supposed to be doing situationally, man up, man down. Now we teach it. This is how I want to do it. This is what I saw you doing in period one. This is what was good, or this is how we're going to correct it. Then we do it. We go out and then again, speed accuracy, start out with a high accuracy movement of the, of the teaching. If we're teaching man up, man down, I need you here. I need you here. You need to be here. When you get the puck, this is what you do with it. Or using terms like we got to get the defense on the carousel, skip passes or whatever terminology as a coach, whatever whatever language that you use to convey to your athletes what needs to be done. We teach it up and then bam, we scrimmage it. With our scrimmage period, we're gonna address and assess what was taught in period three. This is gonna be their test. This is gonna be as a coach, a way of evaluating, did my teaching convey 
what needed to be done on the ice. Because as coaches, we conceptualize this is what this is what my athletes need to do. But sometimes there's that gap from what what I know needs to be done. And then maybe I didn't teach it right. Or maybe I didn't explain it right. Or maybe they weren't listening properly. And so there were, there's a disconnect and it doesn't get taught. It doesn't get conveyed the way I need it to be conveyed. So in the scrimmage period, we're going to test. This is going to be a test for me as a coach. It's going to be a test for the players so that we can iron out all of the problems before it goes live on game day. So at MESA, it's, we're going to iron it out in practice before these, these bleachers are filled with the MESA faithful. And I'm going to be right up there, maybe. One of these days, Corona will, the virus will go away and we can all return to our venues. Then the next point, the next part of the practice is going to be ESD, energy system development. In terms of central nervous system, we have toasted the brain cells. We are, by the time we get to period five, we're 50 minutes into practice, we're out of decisions. And as coaches, we know that the majority of injuries in practice are going to happen at the end. They happen at the end because that central nervous system is a little bit more fatigued. So if we're playing lacrosse and we hit a hole in the field, the central nervous system is going to be a, a couple of milliseconds slower when that ankle rolls and a couple of milliseconds slower on an ankle roll is the difference between the body weight being completely absorbed by the ankle in an improper movement pattern or the ankle being able to right itself and the body getting the body weight off of that foot and preventing that injury. When, we, when we're doing our ESD, the main thing to think about is going to be keep it linear linear keep it for everybody studying for your certs your certification exams nsca planes of the body are huge keep it in the sagittal plane keep it right left right left that cross diagonal gate don't get too fancy with it that's where the injuries happen in terms of our esd depending on how hard the practice was and depending on what our goal is as a strength coach we can do a metabolic cash out. We'll cover that next week when we look at the, the influence of the 800 meter run in track on energy system development. Or we can do what Coach Murphy and the Jacksonville Icemen call a recharge skate. And again, that's going to be very linear. We're going to get to that on the next slide. Real quick, the periods, period, the, so my periods here, one through five they're going to be about 10 minutes in length. And if we look at old practice plans, go back to when I was coming up, mid 80s, even through the 90s when I was my the early 90s when I was wrapping it up at the Qs, each period was about 20 minutes. Back then, the brain worked in 20 minute blocks. You would give it 20 minutes of stimulation, give it about a 5 minute rest, give it about 20 minutes of stimulation, give it a five minute rest, and then at the end of practice, cash it out with a low CNS activity. Nowadays, because of phones, I got a little prop right here. I don't know, is it, there it is right there. There's it's not really showing up, but because of phones and because of technology, our attention span has shortened. Instead of 20 minute periods now, we need 10 minute periods because our attention spans are going to be a lot shorter. It's something I picked up listening to a seminar given by Dave Petromala, former lacrosse coach at Hopkins. And one of the modifications he made with his athletes a little later in his career was that switch from, from 20 minute periods to 10. So instead of having three 20 minute periods, because the athletes have a shorter attention span, it just is what it is due to technology, the world we live in now. Let's shorten it up to 
10 minute periods, we can get the same amount of work in. We're just going to meet the athletes where they are. In terms of our ESD, on our quote fields of ESD, not quite the field of dreams, and I know this is an ice rink, that's why I put fields in quotations. With our fields of ESD, with our metabolic cash out, if, I, if my athletes haven't quite had reached the saturation point of central nervous system fatigue, we're going to do what an example of something we could do is a drill called the marsh funnel. I learned this from Coach Bennett when I was at practice uh, I don't, this year, last year. What the marsh funnel is, it's a combination of high CNS, a little bit of ESD, decision-making, time under tension. The goals are going to go here. We're going to go three on three. We're going to put some tires here to act as boundaries. And then the tires are also going to be essentially the benches for my two teams. Put one team here, one team here. We go three on three. They go for about a minute to 90 seconds of up and down the ice this way. Then coach blows a whistle. There's another coach down here. The six teams race down to this end where there's a loose puck. The, in the, they're going to do a battle, about a, a one-minute battle here, kick the puck out, take a shot on goal here. So we're going to have three goalies. Are going to, our three goalies are going to be involved. We're going to have time under tension. We're going to get a 200-foot skate. That's going to really reinforce by, by this time if it's fifth period in practice, it's going to really start to address that lactate pathway that we've talked about earlier this summer. And then while we have one group of six down here battling, we have another group of six here going three on three. And it's just going to be a cycle. Three on three, funnel down, loose puck, 3v3, shot on goal. And then these players split out, come back to the bench area this way here. While that's going on, we get another 3v3 going on there. So that would be an example of how to take a small-sided game, fold it into a metabolic cash out, also add time under tension to develop that power. Another one that we can do at the end of practice, if it's early in the week, so if it's a Monday, or a Tuesday, and we want to get either some on ice or some on field energy system development, we really want to address that lactate pathway. For hockey, we can do what's called a Herbie. Herbie's homage to the great coach, Herb Brooks, 1980, US Olympic hockey team. He was the coach of the gold medal winning team. Whew, I remember that like it was yesterday. It was 40 years ago. I was 12 then. So with a Herbie, we're going, starting at the red line, starting at the goal line, I should say. We're going blue, goal, red, goal, far blue, goal, far goal, goal. That's one Herbie. We could do several of those using heart rate, heart rate monitoring. We can have a coach up here with some sort of a, some sort of a, a Maybe, maybe Polar Team, shout out Polar Team, uh, Polar Electronics, phenomenal heart rate monitors. And uh, with them, full disclosure, uh, they are helping me out with equipment now. So got to give that full disclosure to my man, uh, Dave at Polar. Thank you. We can have a, a coach over here with Polar Team. When the heart rate hits top of green, we go again. Another way, if we're over here with lacrosse, and it's a Monday or a Tuesday coming up to a Saturday game, we're going to do a rack. I love racks. They're one of, they, they were one of my favorite drills when I was coaching lacrosse. My players didn't like it. So with a rack, we're, we are going to go, we're going top of the restraining box, back, midfield, back, far restraining box, back, far goal, back. That's going to be one rack. 
Coach Murphy does a recharge skate with the Iceman, doing this later in the training week, doing this right around Thursday, Friday, coming up for a game on Saturday. Maybe we're going game on Saturday, game on Sunday. With a recharge skate, what we do is start red, start on the, start on the goal line, and then we go from a, from a stopped position. We go full gas to the blue. Once we hit the blue line, we turn off the jets, and we just go down, circle around the goal, coast back to here, stop, come back around at from a full stopped position, fire it back up again, bam, full gas to the blue, turn off the jets, circle back around. We may do about 10 of those, call it a day. An ESD period is right around 10 minutes. If we're looking at a rack, rack takes about two with two minutes recovery or so. So three racks and you're out. Recharge skates about 10 recharge skates and you're out and then with a herbie two or three maybe four herbies and then you're out the purpose of that that esd cash out the metabolic cash out isn't to put your athletes in a deep state of fatigue it's just to freshen up the energy systems it's just to turn up the heat just a little bit they've already done a lot of work and practice so all we're doing here is filling up the glass, just topping it off. Get in contact with me. I thank everybody for showing up today. Hit me up, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Run Bike Doc, at Run Bike Doc. You want to email me, runbikedoc at gmail.com. YouTube channel, if you missed any of the previous eight episodes, if you want to get the bonus cast with uh, me and Coach Ward, we got some more bonus casts coming up in the near future. Go to YouTube. Just search Doc page. Also, I got the website up and running. Swing over to runbikedoc.com. I want to thank everybody for showing up today. Until next week, keep on keeping on.